Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Maximize Your Historian Data to Avoid Costly Equipment Failures with Predictive Asset Analytics. Before we get started today, I'd like to go over just a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Right now, you're listening in using your computer's speaker system by default, but if you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone option in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. And you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll be collecting them uh, for a Q&A session after today's presentation. Now to introduce myself, my name is Matt Newton. I'm the Senior Portfolio Marketing Manager for the Asset Performance Management business here at Aviva. I've been in the, in the industry for about uh, 15 years or so now. Uh, most of my experience has come from being an applications engineer and a systems engineer, uh, supporting things like embedded systems design, automation systems, uh, wired and wireless networking, quite a bit of networking security technology background, and of course, uh, one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning is the industrial internet of things and the, the possibilities that those applications represent. Also presenting with me today is Elliot Middleton and Drew Bowen. Elliot Middleton is our Director of Product Management here at Aviva. He has over 30 years of experience with industrial software, primarily with process historians, uh, business system integration, and operations intelligence applications. As a product manager, Elliot's responsible for setting the direction of the Aviva information management solutions within the company, including our historian offerings and Aviva Insight. Drew Bowen, also presenting with us today, is a technical sales consultant here at Aviva, specifically for the asset performance management portfolio. Drew has over 10 years of experience as a solutions architect, systems integrator, and technical sales consultant for operational data systems, primarily with predictive maintenance and enterprise data historian applications. As a technical sales consultant, Drew is responsible for supporting and maintaining software demonstrations and delivering proof of concept software implementations for our customers around the world. And so with that quick introduction, I'd like to turn it over to Elliot Middleton for a quick review of Aviva Historian. Uh, thank you, Matt. So uh, we've heard some great things from, from customers about uh, the great value they're getting out of Wonderware Historian, uh, how it makes it easy uh, for them to, to solve problems. And uh, we hear about it in several different areas. These are some the specific categories of value that customers get out of the Historian that they've told us about. Uh, as you can see here, uh, a lot of that's centered around diagnostics and troubleshooting, uh, also some reporting, uh, and a lot of the bigger value opportunities come from identifying improvement opportunities. So one thing that all of these kind of have in common is they're all kind of a looking back. I mean, that is what a historian is for, looking back. And so it's a kind of like looking in the rear view mirror, if you will. Today, we're going to hear about some opportunities to get even more value out of Wonderware Historian. One of those I want to put in context here. So I'm sure most of you are, are using our, our software on-premise. That's where your existing investments are, and that certainly makes sense. That's where uh, almost all of our systems are installed. Y you may have been uh, intrigued, maybe even be considering online solutions for the future as you look at uh, uh, big projects, uh, but also want to make you uh, aware that there are also some hybrid options that kind of fall in between. It's not simply an either-or choice. One of the great reasons to follow a hybrid route is you can leverage some of the online capabilities to get uh, more accessibility to the data. So people outside of the control room have access to it, whether that's from a desktop or from a mobile phone. And we have some great solutions for that. Uh, one of those solutions is uh, Aviva Insight. And the reason I'm bringing it up here is there's a component of this that's related to this predictive uh, machine learning technology that we have. We call it the news feed, and you see it highlighted here. And, and it just continuously monitors your data and reports anomalies uh, based on their significance and what we understand of the relevance of that information. One important thing about this news feed and the machine learning behind it is that it doesn't require any explicit configuration. You just get it by pushing information to Insight. And 
when we talk about machine learning, this is the category of unsupervised machine learning. It's just automatically configured, uh, no real investment of effort on your part. One downside of this approach is that it, it might find things that aren't really that interesting, might not be that significant. And that's kind of the, the, the flip side of getting it for free and with no effort. Uh, we also have a solution that's supervised machine learning. And that's most of what we're going to talk about today. And here, a human expert really invests their expertise, their knowledge of the process and the tools, and you get a lot higher value results uh, because you've made that upfront investment. And PRISM is really the key to that. Both of these really build on the foundation of having uh, good historical data, like what you have in Wonderware Historian. And so that's, that's real critical uh, to both of these kinds of solutions. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over uh, to Matt to talk more about uh, the predictive area. Thanks, Elliot. Uh, great intro there to kind of set up how historian and PRISM predictive asset analytics uh, work together. So to start us off today on our discussion around predictive asset analytics and kind of how things come together and work together behind the scenes, I wanted to set the stage with a quick overview of where Aviva's predictive asset analytics software lives, kind of within the broader Aviva software portfolio and more specifically within our asset performance management portfolio. The, the key idea I want to leave the audience with today is that the historian software that, that Elliot supports and manages is designed to work in conjunction with our predictive asset analytics software. So when we think about integrating those two solutions together and really kind of doing more with the existing data that folks already have in their process historians, this is a, a great way uh, to get started with that and really try to get some, some additional insight out of the data that you've been collecting in your process historian. Now, for the folks in the audience today that might not be familiar with the term asset performance management or what we call APM for short here at Aviva, the discipline of APM focuses on how we can drive maximum return out of our existing asset investments. And so what that translates to on a daily basis is how do we keep our industrial equipment as healthy as possible so that we can get maximum uptime, maximum utilization, and the best possible quality out of the equipment that we use in our day-to-day -day operations and processes. So when we think about equipment, what we're talking about there are our pieces of uh, pumps, compressors, motors. Basically, it's all of the, the heavy industrial equipment that you find in industries like food and beverage, uh, consumer packaged goods, water and wastewater, really any type of energy production and transmission. Certainly, you see a lot of those pieces of equipment in oil and gas and the chemical industry and of course, mining as well. But basically, when we talk about assets, those are the things that are kind of working behind the scenes as part of our process to actually uh, produce the goods that we deliver and bring to market. So really critical piece of the business, obviously, is keeping those things as healthy and, and functional as possible. Now here at Aviva, we split the realm of APM into four key areas of focus. So first we have the, the strategized piece of the software portfolio. And so if you're familiar with things like uh, risk-based maintenance or reliability-centered maintenance, that's where the, the solutions within Aviva's portfolio really live today, which is our, our strategized piece of the portfolio. Next up is our analytics uh, side of the portfolio. So this is where our PRISM predictive asset analytics software lives. We also have condition-based maintenance types of applications. And then uh, there's a variety of solutions to kind of bridge the OT and IT gap and really bring what's happening on the factory floor or the shop floor uh, into what's going on on the business side of things. So connecting that OT, IT divide and providing some KPIs and dashboards to really give you kind of operational insight across the entire business. And then, of course, we have the maintain portion of the portfolio. So this is where we actually go out and execute work on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. So this takes the form of IntelliTrack mobile operator rounds, if you're familiar with that solution. This is where we digitize all of our workflows and work processes and procedures. And this is also where our enterprise asset management software lives, which is basically a, a glorified computerized maintenance management system. Um, so basically that's responsible for keeping track of 
uh, calendar-based maintenance, ordering spare parts, managing the inventory. But the idea here is that we wanna help our customers get complete control over their asset performance management. So we try to manage everything across the entire asset lifecycle as much as possible. And then of course, there's that, that fourth pillar of the portfolio. And this is really where our historian software comes into play and the other asset information management offerings that we have within the portfolio. Now, when we think about the, the historian software that everyone's uh, very likely familiar with today, when we think about the information that's stored in that, in that historian, that's really a priceless commodity that you can't replace. So when we think about how we can do things like improving overall equipment effectiveness, improving asset uptime, getting more utilization out of our existing assets, this is where we can start to leverage the data that's inside your process historian today and do some interesting things with it. For example, predictive asset analytics. Now the key here is how that historian data actually gets plugged into other solutions within the Aviva APM portfolio. So we take that historian data and we can do lots of interesting things with it. So for example, we might use that information to build a digital twin of your process so that we can perfectly predict how your process is going to run every time based on the information that you have stored in that process historian. Or we might use that information to feed into our enterprise asset management software so that we can keep track of spares and, and really stay on top of maintenance activities. There's a variety of capabilities that we can layer on top of the data that's already stored in your process historian today. Uh, but for today's topic, we're gonna focus in on the predictive analytics uh, and the software capabilities that, that that offers. Now, when we look at uh, maintenance and, and maintenance drivers and really trying to improve our asset health and, and maximize asset uptime, ARC estimates that downtime costs the process industry somewhere in the area of a trillion dollars per year. And they think there's also a lot of hidden costs that they can account for there. But that's a, a pretty expensive uh, liability that the business needs to worry about. And that goes across all the industries that, uh, that our customers are in today. When we need to down a production line to service a piece of equipment, it can be pretty costly. And it's even more expensive if we have more of an unscheduled outage from something like a random asset failure or if we experience something like a sewage spill that could lead to regulatory fines or possibly putting uh, people into an unsafe environment. Um, so some real critical problems related to unplanned downtime and assets actually breaking down. Now to, to kind of add on to that problem, ARC also estimates that about 82% of equipment failures are completely random. So what that means is that our, our traditional approach of maintaining our equipment, those pumps, compressors, the motors, the, the variable frequency drives out there, the, the calendar-based and maybe even the utilization-based maintenance strategy that a, lot, that a lot of companies are using today simply isn't going to address that 82% of random failures. So what that means is that we need something more advanced to help us catch those failures before they, they can occur. So something that can, uh, go beyond what we see from a traditional calendar-based maintenance type of application and give us more insight on the actual health of that piece of equipment. And that's exactly where Aviva's predictive asset analytics software comes into play today. Now, when we talk about predictive analytics, it's really important to note here that we're talking about analytics specifically in relation to industrial equipment. Remember the, the pumps, compressors, motors, all of that heavy equipment that drives our processes we're focused, we have a, a laser focus on those specific types of equipment and applying analytics to them. Now there's a lot of buzz in the industry today about analytics and how it's being applied to so many different cutting edge applications and healthcare and the interesting things that we're doing with machine learning and, and space exploration, and that's all fine and great. But for Aviva, our laser focus here today is on industrial assets and equipment. And how do we keep those particular pieces of equipment uh, from experiencing unscheduled downtime and, and really having those critical failures that have a, a dramatic impact on the bottom line of the business. Now, the way that we do that is we start off with the data in your process historian. And obviously we're pulling all of that data in from sensors and other process variables within your application. And that really kind of helps us describe how your assets and your pieces of equipment function in the real world. So with that historical information, we can start to understand what your process looks like and, and how the different pieces of equipment kind of come together and really understand across all of the different load levels in your application or in your process, what is known good behavior? 
So that could be something like shutting a valve on your chlorine tank. If you're in a water treatment plant, it might be something like starting up your dough laminator or oxidizing your ovens, whatever it may be for your application. You could think of it almost as building a digital twin of how your equipment, those pumps and compressors and valves, how all of those things typically work on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, once we understand what that known good working uh, digital twin looks like, that's when we can deploy real-time monitoring software to keep an eye on your equipment. We can start to use things like machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence, advanced pattern recognition, and we can apply that to the operational data ranges that you've collected in your historian and basically determine potential outcomes. So that's where we can begin to spot those tiny little anomalies in how your equipment is running uh, and those things that within your process that might be trending towards a potential failure. So at that point, once we, we've described the digital twin, we know how it should behave, we've identified something trending towards a potential problem, that's where we can actually step in and prescribe what we think is the best course of action. So maybe that means that something like uh, the bearings uh, within a particular piece of equipment need to be uh, need to be serviced, or maybe there's a worn out part on a packaged goods line, whatever it may be, uh, we can get to it and address it before it becomes a critical problem for the business. But remember, the, the key thing to, to note here is that all of that begins with that historian data that you already have stored in your process historian. That's what we use to build out our models, and that's where we're able to, to bolt on this analytics capability and actually start to predict these failures before they can occur. Now, once we actually do predict those failures, um, this is where uh, the software steps in and it can alert on those deviations. And it does this anywhere from days, weeks, or months before the equipment actually breaks down. So the idea here is not to get to the equipment an hour before we're going to experience an outage, but we wanna get there long before. So think a couple of weeks before uh, we actually have a critical failure, we wanna be able to get there troubleshoot the problem, investigate, identify what's actually causing the problem, and then maybe we need to order spare parts to service that piece of equipment, whatever it may be. The idea is to get there before there's a critical asset failure. So this is where we actually um, can take it a step further and we can start to identify specific problems in equipment and do some root cause analysis and then bring that out across uh, the rest of the manufacturing line, tweak uh, process optimization, whatever it may be to get uh, increased availability and reliability out of your equipment. So when we think about analytics and what we're, what we're kind of doing on the back end and how the software actually works, what we do is we take those huge data sets that are stored in your process historian today, and we actually kind of turn them into actionable insight. So we turn what would otherwise be noise and random numbers that you've been collecting for years and years and storing in your process historian, we run it through our analytics engine, um, and then basically we're able to determine how things should actually operate. Now imagine trying to comb through all of the data that you have stored in your process historian, all of that big industrial data, if you will, uh, and identify that one tiny little anomaly in how your process is working today. Um, it would, you know, the, the term finding the needle in a haystack doesn't do it justice here. When we think about the, the tons and tons of data that most people have stored in their process historian. And that's exactly what our predictive asset analytics software is designed to do. We take those large data sets and we do something a little more interesting with it. We try to provide some insight into how uh, equipment should be uh, behaving and performing. Uh, and then we try to do what we can to maximize availability for that asset and try to make everything as reliable as possible. And that's really what the power of analytics is. It's catching those tiny little anomalies those things that we just don't have time to catch with the human eye, we just certainly don't have time uh, on our day-to-day -day basis to comb through that amount of data. And we spot those tiny little anomalies long before they turn into a real critical problem for the business. So again, remember, we're, we're trying to catch things before they fail, you know, even months in advance in some applications. Now, when we think about the types of assets that we monitor and the industries where this software is typically deployed today, um, for predictive analytics types of applications, you're gonna see here that there's a, a commonality of assets across a lot of these industries. And one thing that's important to note here is that remember that the software doesn't necessarily care what type of equipment or asset you may be using in your specific application and in your specific industry. 
what we're doing here is we're taking that analytics engine, uh, that machine learning tool set, and we're applying it to the data in your historian to build out that model. So if you can abstract out the idea of this is a piece of equipment and really look at it from the perspective of my equipment is generating data and, and that's coming in in the form of sensor information, process variables, whatever it may be. So my equipment's kind of trying to speak to me in a certain way. And so what we do with the analytics engine is we kind of provide that translation, if you will, from big data into actionable insight so that we can actually see what's going on with your equipment in real time. So you could be in a food and beverage or a consumer packaged goods type of application, and you could deploy analytics on your mixers, your boilers, your ovens. If you're in water and wastewater or infrastructure, you might deploy predictive analytics to monitor your VFDs, or maybe you're working with chillers or heat exchangers. Remember, it, it doesn't really matter what the asset is. What we're doing is we need to take a, a certain amount of data, typically a, a month's worth of good operational data, and that's where we can begin to build out that model and really start to deploy the analytics to, to kind of figure out what that big data is trying to tell us. But to get you started quickly, um, we also include a number of pre-built model templates in our predictive analytics software. And the idea here is that we want to get you up and running as quickly as possible so you can accelerate your time to deployment by using those pre-built models and really get to a return on investment of your industrial software that much faster. I know um, predictive analytics is a very new technology for a lot of people uh, in our industrial markets today. I know that pilots can drag on as we as we investigate these new technologies. So what we're trying to do here with things like model templates um, is make sure that you can get to value as quickly as possible um, without having to do any type of software development or programming or debugging. Um, it's much less of a platform and much more of a, a tool set, if you will. Now, we also have the ability to monitor all of the alarms and notifications that the software sends. Um, we, we do that through a web-based portal. So what that means is you can have multiple people logged into the software, checking different types of assets, processes, equipment, and responding to all of those alarms uh, wherever they're located in your facility. So you may have people spread out across multiple facilities, multiple geographies. Uh, utilizing web-based technology, we can bring all of those people together so that they're all on the same page um, they can even troubleshoot problems together, um, really kind of work together uh, in more of a team environment. The software also supports uh, fault diagnostics. So you can use that to go back and determine what caused a problem in the first place. There's a, a playback feature where we can go back and look at how things were operating, um, really kind of give you insight much more in depth into the, uh, the health of your equipment and your assets as they're running their processes today. And then of course, we'll once you know what the problem was, uh, there's a case library built into the software so that if something comes up again in the future that may look familiar or maybe you spot uh, two anomalies that look pretty much identical, you'll be able to go back and look up what that problem was in the past and how it, resolve, how it was resolved the last time around. So it actually gives you almost a, a prescription of what you need to perform based on data that we've already collected and that users have, have already input into the system. Now, when it comes to deploying the software, where we have a variety of models available. So we're very flexible as far as how you actually utilize that software. You can install the software uh, on your premises, behind your firewall, if that's what works for you. I know a lot of companies are very interested in keeping these types of things in-house and secure as much as possible, really owning their data. So we definitely support uh, that type of model. We can also host the software through a SaaS model, so software as a service handle everything for you up in the cloud and basically just deliver the capabilities uh, to you through a web portal. Or we also offer a monitoring and diagnostic service uh, where we basically monitor all of your assets and equipment remotely. We've got a team of expert engineers deployed in several sites across the world. And basically they sit and look at the, the predictive models all day. They, they manage the alarms that are coming in. Um, they work with the onsite team to remediate potential problems. Whatever it may be, it's almost like an eye in the sky for you looking after uh, the health of all of your equipment. Now, to get a, a further idea of how your process historian data feeds into our predictive analytics software and, and how quick and easy that is to set up, let me turn it over to Drew Bowen for a quick demo on how these two solutions actually come together.
All right, thanks, Matt. Let me go ahead and get my demo system up here. So hi, everyone. As Matt mentioned, I'm Drew Bowen. I'm a technical sales consultant with Aviva. Um, I'll be walking you through a quick software demonstration. So we'll go through the process of building a predictive model within the Prism application. I'll show you how fast and easy it is to get up and running um, with an initial model for a pump. And then um, if we have time, we'll go ahead and jump into the Prism web page and take a quick look at the monitoring and diagnostics approach. So again, the first thing we'll be doing is building a predictive model from scratch. This won't be deployed from a template. I'll show you from start to finish the, the entire process and what it takes to get going here. So the first thing that we're always gonna do is add points from our historian. Um, in this case, we'll be adding points from Wonderware historian, uh, but as you can see, out of the box, we support a wide variety of interfaces. Um, so even if you've got other historians on site, we can, we can pull data from them as well. Uh, but we'll show you how quick and easy it is to get data from Wonderware Historian here. So I'll go ahead and select that as my data source. Now what we're going to do is pull in those specific uh, process points that refer to instrumentation coming off of this pump. In this case, I've sorted them kind of nice and quickly up at the top of my list. Uh, so I'll just scroll down and, and pull some of these points in. Um, what we would typically do is uh, either working with you or your, your experts on site would know the, the process variables or the tags that are associated with these assets and, and come in and select those tags associated with the given model. So I'm gonna pick a list of tags here and we'll go ahead and select those to import them into the model. And you'll see now that um, these particular tags and their descriptions have been, have been pulled into the predictive model. Now the, the second step with building any predictive model is going to be importing historical training data. So as Matt mentioned, what we do is we take that big data set, um, all of the, the instrumentation and process variables coming off of this particular asset, um, and we learn from that data. So we, we, we wanna clean that data up so that it represents normal, healthy operations for this asset, in this case, this pump. Now, um, one of the capabilities is to pull data directly from Wonderware Historian. So in this case, you'll see here the list of tags that I've selected. Um, it's the same tag list that we generated previously, pulling them from the historian. Uh, and you would select to start an in time as well as a sample frequency. Uh, typically in Prism, um, you know, we can start with as little as maybe, you know, a couple weeks to a month of historical data. The kind of ideal range would usually be about six months of data. Um, and that data would represent kind of normal, all of the normal operating states for the asset, um, as well as any ambient conditions if, if the asset is, um, you know, subject to external influence from ambient conditions. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is I've, I've framed this data up in a really nice time frame in a CSV file. So I'm actually going to go ahead and pull in my training data from a CSV file here and import this into my predictive model. Now, regardless of where we get the data from, the next step is gonna to be to clean up that data, like I said, so that it represents good, normal, healthy operational behavior. If I click through some of these tags that we've pulled in from the historian, um, you'll see here that there's various conditions where the signal kind of drops down to zero. This is gonna be reflective of normal conditions in your plant, um, whether the asset's being taken offline for maintenance or just routine startups and shutdowns, you know, if we lost a connection to the PLC, um, or maybe even kind of anomalous conditions, like you see this little bit of a dropout here. What we want is to represent good, normal, healthy behavior for this asset. Now we give you two tools to do that. The first is an automated tool. So I'll zoom in and show you our automated outlier detection. If I choose mark here, the software will go in and automatically find any conditions where it looks like the signal uh, doesn't represent good, normal, healthy behavior, and it will highlight them on the screen. Now, some of these are so small that you can hardly even see um, the areas that have been shaded. Uh, the other option that we give you is to manually select the data. So to kind of draw a box around it, if you will, um, and then delete that data from the model. So that's what I'm gonna do in this case. I'm gonna go ahead and draw a box around all of these kind of signal dropouts or times where the pump was offline and, and kind of the anomalous uh, data. And you'll see here that it's all shaded now. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click delete and that removes the data from the training data set. Now it's important to note this doesn't remove it from the historian itself, it simply removes it from the training data set within PRISM. So you'll see now that um, for this particular tag, uh, this bearing temperature, now we have what looks like a normal operating profile. 
this is where having a little bit of the subject matter expertise um, in terms of knowing how this piece of equipment normally operates comes into play. And that's really all you need for PRISM is just to have some understanding of the equipment, the tags that are associated with the equipment and how it normally operates. Now, if I click through some of the other tags, you'll see that all of their profiles have been cleaned up as well. What we do in PRISM to make the data cleanup process very quick and easy for you is when we delete data at a particular point in time, say for example, March 1st at 12 a.m., we would go through and delete the data for all of the tags in this predictive model at March 1st at 12 a.m. And if you think about this piece of equipment in a real life circumstance, the pump when it's you know, shut down or you know, if there's some kind of anomalous condition, those conditions are gonna impact pretty much all of the tags at the same time. And so we remove the data by time slice um, so that you don't have to go through and manually clean up each tag. Now, if you did wanna clean up each tag individually, you have that option as well, but generally it's not required. So now that I've cleaned up the historical data and we have what represents good, normal operational behavior for this asset, I'm gonna go ahead and create what we call a filter. So bear with me one moment while I set this up and then I'll zoom in. All right, so I'll zoom in so you can actually see my screen. So what we can do with filters are create kind of logical conditions, in this case, a filter where our pump is turned off. Um, I've selected a steam flow tag and my logical condition is whenever the steam flow is less than 10 kbh. And what we'll do under those conditions are turn off the operating profile or, or basically keep the model from running under those conditions. And so what will happen is you won't be generating any nuisance alarms or any nuisance warnings when that occurs. Now there's other use cases for filters as well. Say for example, um, you have kind of a, a batch process or a process on a line where there's multiple products coming through. We can also use filters to run different models under different conditions. So a lot of use cases here, but in this case, we're just gonna use it to eliminate nuisance alarms when the, the pump is turned off. So I'll go ahead and deploy that filter. Now we're gonna go ahead and create our operational profile. In this case, the operating profile represents um, that kind of digital signature or digi digital operational twin for this pump. So I'll zoom in just a little bit. Um, what we're doing is we're selecting our training data set, our pump training data, all of the tags from the Wonderware historian that we're using um, for this pump model. And we're gonna go ahead and run it through that uh, predictive analytics algorithm. I'll go ahead and call this pump profile and we'll say, okay. And this is where all of the heavy lifting occurs. So now PRISM has gone ahead and generated that digital signature for this asset for normal healthy behavior. Now one final step before we deploy this model, I'll go into our alarm thresholds. And I wanna talk about one quick concept. So you'll see the very first row in this table says overall model residual. The overall model residual you can think of as the drift of the predicted model, so the state that we predict this asset should be in right now, away from the state that that asset is currently in in real time, and we represent that as a percentage value. So again, PRISM is very good at recognizing subtle changes to operational behavior in an asset. So normally we can start with very low values. I'll go ahead and set the high alarm to 10% and the high warning to 5%. So whenever the model is drifting away from the, the actual state, um, as a 10 percentage overall value or 5% value, that's when we'll uh, provide alerts or warnings. Now you'll see here if I click on actual value, um, even uh, relative or actual signal deviation, we can also create individual alerts or warnings for each of the signals that we're predicting values for. Uh, but in this case, for this very simple model, we'll just go ahead and use the overall model residual. One other thing that I'm gonna go ahead and do is change our alarm window to a percentage of time. And I'm gonna change that to 60 out of 120 seconds. So what that means is that our overall model residual has to have reached 5% or 10% deviation away from the predicted state for that time band, 60 out of 120 seconds, uh, before we would actually generate any alerts or warnings. So that keeps you again from getting those kind of instantaneous nuisance alerts. So I'm gonna go ahead and click OK here. Now, if we were receiving um, real-time data off of this pump uh, coming into our Wonderware plant historian, um, then in this case, you would be ready to start monitoring this asset in real time. Those are all the steps that are required to take um, the historical data, to clean it up, to train the model, and, and build and deploy the model in PRISM. So you can see how very simple uh, this process is. 
Now we also give you another tool called data playback. I'm gonna go ahead and import an additional training data file. And this training data file leads up to a failure for this particular pump. So there's not the actual failure, failure data in here, um, but kind of the conditions leading up to when this pump did fail in real life. Now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and take our data playback tool and select our test data set. And then overlay our alert conditions. And what we can do, if I take a look at this top trend, you'll see this is our overall model residual. It's kind of like our check engine light for the whole model. If I zoom in on this particular chart, you'll see our five and 10% bands. And you can see that overall model residual, the drift start to go up a little bit starting around October of 2017 kind of creeping up into warning territory, maybe somewhere around December, and then hitting a lot of alerts and warnings um, all the way into January and February of 2018. So for this particular asset, going back and looking at what led up to this particular failure, we can see that we would have had probably at least two months worth of warning where we could have spent that time to go out and inspect the asset, order parts, um, perform maintenance, any other actions that are required before this asset actually failed. This is a very typical case. Again, what we're looking for is days, weeks, or months worth of warning. Um, and this is what you would see generally kind of in a real life condition. Uh, just quickly, I'll show you some of the other tools in the Prism desktop client. Um, so if I just kind of come in here and kind of click through this overall model residual, you'll see a contribution chart on the bottom. These are all of the tags that are coming in for our predictive model, um, just the short tag names. And as I kind of click as the model residual drifts up, you can see which tags were the leading contributors. So our, our desktop client is really intended for building predictive models, but you can see here that we already have some level of diagnostic capabilities as well. If you know the bearing temperatures or bearing vibration is going up, um, we have kind of some leading indicators as to what might be going wrong. All right, so with that, I've walked through the entire process to build a predictive model, to deploy it within the software, um, and then to go back and uh, validate that we would have had early warning for this equipment failure, um, or you could have used the data playback tool for um, kind of alarm tuning, if you will. So one other thing I wanna jump over to and just spend a little bit of time on is our monitoring and diagnostics webpage in PRISM. So this is our PRISM website. Um, what this allows you to do is take all of your predictive models and view any alerts or warnings that are being generated from the system in real time. So I'm just gonna walk through a couple things in this webpage and speak to them. If I look through some of these columns, the first column is gonna be each of our predictive models that are deployed for this particular plant. Now it is possible to have more than one model for an asset. And in this case, our pump, if it has a lot of instrumentation, um, maybe we'll deploy more of a process model as well as a kind of mechanical or reliability model. Um, so you'll see here that we actually have uh, two uh, pump models in this case for a single asset. Next is our alarm state column. So any alerts or warnings that have come in, we can quickly see if there's any alerts on this asset. Now on this demo system, it's really busy, so it's constantly generating alerts or warnings. You can see here, all of our models have a new alert that's come in. That's what this red star indicates. We do provide built-in workflow in the web page. So as you start to diagnose and troubleshoot what might be coming out of this alert or warning, um, and as you start to follow the workflow, so if you're performing an inspection or performing maintenance on this asset, we can track all of that in the built-in workflow, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then runtime status, we can see the current state of the model. So for this particular model, um, the circulating water pump, the reliability model, you can see here that it's a red square. That means that we're currently in an alert condition. The yellow triangle would be a, mean a warning condition, and then the green circle would mean that we're currently okay. So just because we've generated an alert or warning in the past doesn't mean that we're in an alert or warning state right now. And then finally, all the way over on the right-hand side, again, this is a pretty busy demo system, uh, but what this represents is a seven-day event history. So the yellow or orange bar is going to be warnings, and the red bar is going to be alerts. So you can quickly see out of the last seven days, how much of the time were we in an alert state or were we in a warning state? So you have a quick reference to see the overall state of this model for the last week. Now, if I wanna come in and do some diagnosis for this particular model, um, the circulating water pump, its reliability model, 
I see I have a new alert here. So if I was a monitoring user, I would want to come in and do some level of diagnosis before we take action. So I'm going to go ahead and click on our trending page. Um, now I've already zoomed in on a trend earlier. Um, this trend is, uh, the top trend is always going to be showing our overall model residual. So that drift of the model as a whole away from the predicted state. And then beneath the overall model residual, we'll have all of the individual signals plotted um, showing their actual values, which you'll see in black, as well as the predicted state, which you'll see in green. Um, you can see some of our tags or signals have drifted much further away than others. Um, so you get some idea of leading indicators, which, which individual tags or instrumentation um, are, are the biggest contributors to the model deviation. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is click on our fault diagnostics. So during Matt's portion of the presentation, he talked about fault diagnostics, and you can think of those as kind of known failure modes for an asset. So whether this is some kind of mechanical issue around the bearings, maybe a motor failure, uh, maybe there's a leak on this pump, those are the types of known failure modes um, that we could create in our model templates. And what PRISM will do is as that model residual starts to grow, it will pattern match against those known failure modes and tell you which kind of failure mode is the most likely failure mode that's occurring. So we can see here on my screen, um, we have a pump thrust bearing problem. Um, there's two different bars on this bar chart. The first is green, that's gonna be an instantaneous pattern match. And then blue is gonna be an average pattern match. So what that means is at some point in time on this overall model residual chart, we had a 100% instantaneous pattern match but over the entire span, over this entire two hours, 22.6% of the time, um, we had a pattern match against this, this failure mode. So as that blue bar starts to grow, you can have pretty certain confidence that that's the type of failure mode that's occurring. Now, if I click on that failure mode, this pump thrust bearing problem, um, we actually give you prescriptive information as well. So built into our model templates, we can put in things like a description of what this failure mode means, as well as next steps that you would take to go and carry out an inspection, uh, to perform maintenance, whatever the, the next type of action should be for this particular piece of equipment. So you can see within Prism Web, we give you a lot of diagnostic tools for this early warning catch um, to go out and already have some indication from your monitoring center what type of problem might be occurring. So now you can go take really specific action um, related to the type of failure that you believe is occurring on that piece of equipment. Now just quickly coming back over again, if I was a user monitoring this system, I would jump into our built-in workflow tool. So you can see here all of the alerts and warnings that have been generated for this piece of equipment. And I would set it to some kind of state here. So whether this is um, you know, a new alarm, uh, that we want to acknowledge and we're going to watch it further. Um, we'll monitor this piece of equipment over time to see how the equipment is degrading or if it's getting better. If we know it's an equipment or a model tuning issue or an instrumentation issue. So we can assign all of that in the workflow here. And then as Matt mentioned earlier, we could go ahead and create a case um, so we can start to track that work over time. If I come into our case management system and just click on an example case, um, you'll see here that we can put in things like a title and a description. Uh, we can put in information for the case status, whether it's open, closed, the priority, and the category. One thing that I find really important, and I'll speak to quickly here, is links. So Matt mentioned that over time, this becomes a, a knowledge repository, if you will, for previous types of failures that have occurred and the actions that you've taken on that piece of equipment. So in addition to just the description of um, what this case is about, we can also upload information like an engineering drawing or an inspection if we've performed an inspection or if someone's gone out and taken pictures of that piece of equipment. All of that knowledge can be added to the case management system. And this is searchable so that you can come back in and see how you've performed uh, maintenance and inspections over time in the past. One final thing to speak to is the resolution tab. So if you're investing in a predictive maintenance program, it is important to track the return on investment that you're getting out of that program over time. Um, so you can track things like the fault condition, whether, whether it's a mechanical issue or an instrumentation issue. Uh, you can track the response that you took as well as the impact to your organization. And then finally, the financial value associated with this early warning catch. Um, and so the financial value could take into account a lot of different things, maybe lost production, 
uh, loss of the piece of equipment, uh, various safety or regulatory issues. So there's a lot of factors that weigh into that, and it's important to track that information over time. All right, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude the um, software demonstration. So again, what we've done is we've walked through the entire process to build a predictive model, as well as to come in and uh, monitor any alerts or, or warnings that you're getting from your system. So Matt, I think I'll go ahead and uh, turn it back over to you here. Thanks, Drew, that was a, uh, a great demo. Let me uh, switch back to uh, my presentation here. But I actually, I took a minute to time you building the model there, Drew, and just so every, everyone in the audience knows, it took Drew 16 minutes to put together a predictive analytics model uh, with existing historian data. So the reason I bring that up is I, I just want to take a minute to, to note that that's really the power of Aviva's industrial software portfolio today. All of these solutions within the portfolio uh, are designed to work together to provide as much value as possible to our customers. So when we think about uh, integrating different types of solutions and tool sets, a lot of that work has already been done for our customers behind the scenes. And that's what you see uh, with the demo here that Drew just showed with Historian connecting directly to uh, predictive, predictive analytics and, and being that data source. It's all designed to work together as fluidly as possible. Uh, so with that said, uh, one other thing I wanted to note here before we move into Q&A uh, is that Aviva is a, a trusted brand within this space. We've been in this industry of analytics and, and predictive modeling for well over a decade now. We're certainly recognized as an industry leader in the asset performance management space. You can see here that several of the, the large uh, analyst firms have reported on Aviva having a best of breed solution. They've positioned us as a visionary in the marketplace. Uh, and one of the key reasons for that is the flexible licensing model that we've recently delivered to our customers. So solutions within the APM portfolio like Prism Predictive Asset Analytics or, or Aviva's Historian offerings, all of the different solutions we offer, they can be delivered to you in a perpetual license uh, on-prem type of uh, scenario, just like we've, we've done for many, many years. But we've also introduced subscription pricing as well. So when we think about kind of getting started with these new technologies. Subscription access is a really great way to get started with solutions that we may not be familiar with. So things like predictive analytics really helps you kind of get your feet wet and really determine, is this solution going to actually work in my particular application before you have to invest a lot of uh, upfront additional dollars. Now to support your investigation further uh, of predictive analytics and really what you can do with all of that archived process historian data, we've actually put together a special promotion here where current historian customers who purchase predictive asset analytics, uh, basically by the end of the calendar year, you'll get three months of subscription uh, to predictive analytics for free. So great way to get started, some incentive there to take a look at a new technology that we think can certainly provide a lot of value uh, in a wide variety of applications and really keep your equipment as reliable as possible. And so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for our Q&A discussion. And we've actually got quite a few in the queue here already. And Drew, I think we're gonna have to rely on your expertise for uh, a number of these. So let me give you the first one, uh, which is can predictive analytics uh, help us predict the health of equipment and can it also be set up to provide efficiency of equipment or of a process? For example, uh, multiple pumps. Uh, if you're using multiple pumps in a situation, can we figure out what the correct number of pumps is for optimal configuration, something like that? So can we do optimization uh, through predictive analytics? Sure. Um, can you still hear me, Matt, just before I respond? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay, great. So uh, generally speaking, we're gonna be looking at the equipment or process health, if you will. Um, we, we can certainly look at, as you've seen, overall equipment reliability and equipment health. Um, we are also uh, just kind of getting into uh, model building for processes. Um, so kind of looking at first principle inputs and outputs of a predictive model um, to look at efficiency. I would say that's a bit of a new area that we're starting to explore. Um, the, the key to consider is that PRISM is truly a statistical machine learning tool. Um, so, you know, if you have historical data around a piece of equipment or around a process, 
um, you, you can generate an output um, and, and get information about whether things are deviating away from that good, healthy historical state um, through that model residual that I showed you during the software demonstration. Now, and, and we do offer other products such as um, simulation products that may be a little bit better suited for the overall uh, efficiency that was described in this question, um, but we, we may have to circle back on that one just a little bit more. Okay, great. So uh, we will follow up with the individual that asked that question. Um, so next question, if I have a flow rate out of range for more than two minutes, can I set up an alert based on the minutes that my flow is out of range? Sure, great question. So uh, the first thing that you can do, as I showed in the um, software demonstration with the time bands, is you can make it so that your alerts are not triggered um, unless if you reach that set point for a certain amount of time. Um, now, once the alert is generated, you can go back and look at the individual um, tags or instrumentation, in this case, that flow rate, and you would see that that flow rate was the leading contributor over time. So you'll get really specific information about the start um, and potentially end time that that condition occurred and, and why it was impacting the model during that state. Great. And then uh, another question here. Uh... Do we have the capability to send information directly to SAP, for example, stoppages from a specific process line or equipment? So I guess basically we would be sending notifications up to SAP, maybe for maintenance or something like that. Can we do that, Drew? Um, so, so I'll just add one thing quickly. So uh, we do have the ability to generate email notifications when an alert or warning is, uh, occurs. So you can have notifications go directly to end users. Uh, in relationship to SAP, so generally there's going to be some level of diagnosis, human diagnosis that occurs from a predictive alert uh, before you would generate a work order in, in Maximo or SAP or any other EAM system. Um, so, so usually your your monitoring user would come into the web interface, they would see that you got an alert, they would do that level of diagnosis, um, and then create the work order from there. Um, we are working on integration that allows you from the, the workflow to automatically um, build out a work order as well, and, and that's coming in the near future. That's great. So another question, I'll field this one. What is the difference between a uh, Wonderware historian and a Viva historian? Um, so just to clarify, a Viva historian, Wonderware historian, they're the same offering um, as a Viva has come together with a variety of new brands. Um, some names are moving around a little bit, but one thing to keep in mind with Prism Predictive Asset Analytics is that as far as data sources are concerned, you can use you know, CSV file like what Drew showed today. Um, we can use your Wonderware historian data, Viva historian, uh, eDNA enterprise data management, uh, OSI soft, whatever uh, solution you may be using today for uh, managing your big data, it's very likely that it, it will plug directly into uh, Prism Predictive Asset Analytics. Um, so I'm just uh, scrolling through the questions here. Uh, let's see. Do you offer APIs to automatically monitor the state of the digital twin and let clients customize their integration? Now, Drew, I know we have a REST API available for predictive analytics. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what that API is for and maybe any others that might be available? Sure, absolutely. So the REST API gives you access to all of the model information, so the alerts and warnings that have been triggered. Um, basically what I showed you through the monitoring and diagnostics page, that, that information you have access to through the REST API. Um, and through that REST API, it's pretty easy to hook into business intelligence tools like Tableau or Power BI. Um, so you have that capability to monitor in, in other um, places if you'd like. The other thing that we do is all of the um, time series data that you see, um, all of those trends and, and diagnostic charts that you saw, those can be written back to your historian. So they can be written back to Wonderware historian, um, they can be written back to a local uh, archive built into Prism, um, and then you would have access to that time series data as well. So you could see the predicted values as well as the, the real-time values coming in off of those assets through whatever historian product you're using and, and through the dashboarding tools that they provide. Great, and uh, the questions are really streaming in here. So can IOs be programmed as alarm points to be followed? Um, 
So w- what we can do is we can take individual um, IO points or tags and we can create individual alerts or warnings on each of those. In the software demonstration, I showed you an alert or warning on just the overall model residual. Um, but for each individual tag or instrument, uh, you can take a you can set an alert or warning condition for those as well, based on the deviation between the predicted and the actual state. So you would be able to track each individual um, tag if you would like to. Yeah, and, and another question, I know you, you kind of addressed it earlier, but how much instrumentation is required in order to use PRISM? And I think this goes back to how much how much data do we need? Um, right, that's a great question. So um, typically what you would need as a, as a minimum input to a model is somewhere around four or five um, you know, tags or sensors that are recording data coming off of an asset. So, so we're leveraging the relationship between that instrumentation um, in our machine learning algorithm to, to build that profile. So there does have, have to be some level of instrumentation. Now to add on to that just a little bit, when Matt talked about model templates, so we do have many, many model templates built out for common uh, makes and models of industrial equipment. And so what we can do is if you have less instrumented assets, is we can take a look and see what is the recommended instrumentation to go into a model and let you know if you have enough instrumentation or not. And, and you know, once you've started to build out a predictive maintenance program, you start to get some return on investment from that program. Maybe you can justify adding in additional sensors or instrumentation through kind of an IIoT program. That's great. Well, I think that uh, that rounds out the questions we have in the queue right now. So I think uh, we'll go ahead and close out our session today. But just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone in the audience today. Uh, if you have any further questions on how the software works, uh, please reach out to uh, your account manager or, or your partner that you work with. We'll also be sending a follow-up email within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. Uh, and then of course, uh, as questions may arise as you're taking a closer look at the software um, and how predictive analytics works with your existing historian installation, you know, feel free to reach out to our support teams and our technical consultants and our sales teams. We're all here to, uh, to help you figure out if this solution uh, works in your particular application. So feel free to reach out. And with that, we'll go ahead and close out for today. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.